Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly livestock market update. I'm Brownfield News Anchor reporter Megan Grebner. With us is University of Missouri Scott Brown. Good afternoon, Scott. Good afternoon, Megan. You know, we, we try and we look and we hope maybe every Friday uh, that we have something positive to talk about, but it really looks like uh, the livestock markets had another down week this week. Yeah, I think when you look across the board, we don't have a lot of good news. Uh, you know, pork prices uh, off another dollar and a half or so relative to a week ago. You look at feeder cattle prices, uh, where we're down one to eight, but what most markets are reporting, you know, we saw some instances of being down 10 to $15 a hundred as well. Um, fairly light fed cattle traffic so far in, in the week, but uh, perhaps down another dollar to $2 a hundred as well. So all of those prices moving lower again. Uh, choice beef prices down for, for the week as well, as is the pork cutout value. So we're not seeing, uh, you know, a lot of strength on the wholesale side as well. Futures markets for uh, cattle have been a little uh, uh, less down, I guess, as we went through the week. They've been fairly flat after uh, a, a Tuesday that was down, uh, coming back here later in the week to be up. Uh, hog futures down a little bit for the week as well. But uh, uh, per perhaps the one side we've got up on uh, corn prices as we've gone through this week as well. So we've had another uh, 20 to 25 cents a bushel on corn prices as we move through the week. So uh, moving not necessarily in the direction we want on the feed cost side. So lower, uh, lower uh, hog and cattle prices and, and higher in feed inputs uh, ha hasn't made the, uh, the equation any better for profitability. We talk about some of the negative things and in, in, in the price move downward. We did get um, export values for August, and it looks like there's some, some positive notes and some good things coming out of those numbers. Absolutely. And, you know, I always like to remind us that when, when we look ahead, the, the growth in consumption and demand, I think, will continue to come from export markets uh, as we see a population in this country who, yes, will continue to consume uh, uh, meat as we look ahead. But it's really those new markets that I think are going to be important for us in other parts of the world. So August beef exports uh, were, were up uh, about 106 uh, thousand metric tons relative uh, 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 27 percent increase up to about 106 uh, thousand metric tons pork exports were also up about 16 percent uh, for for the month of August so relative to a year ago so we are seeing some good news there and, and I think when you look at both the uh, uh, export levels as well, well as volume levels we are seeing some positives there so uh, export values also showing some some modest growth relative to what we've seen for a while so many of those markets uh, for me continue to, to point to perhaps some uh, continued growth as we look ahead. Again, I think exchange rates will become uh, critically important on those markets as well. If the dollar were to strengthen substantially, I know that will really slow down where we go. Um, I think we've talked about this a time or two, but markets like China continue to be important. Uh, we're not moving a lot of U.S. beef into China right now, but I think the hope is that that, that market will open to us over time and that might be one of the, the positives that we can continue to talk about for the next several months as, as that market opens for us. And it works not only just in terms of muscle cuts or higher cuts of beef, but also some of those odd cuts that we don't utilize here as well, correct? That's absolutely right. You know, when you look at the muscle cuts, we were up, but we were also up in those variety meats as well. And, and many times we get the value from uh, a number of other countries. We don't consume all of those products that we get from a, pork carcass or a beef carcass, yet uh, a number of other countries find uh, or have a demand for those products. And, and so it does create added value that does get passed through ultimately to producers. And so uh, all, all of those very sensitive in terms of where exchange rates go in front of us, whether you look at muscle cuts or those variety meats as well. We talk about those markets and a place to put our product. Let's talk a little bit about weekly production numbers and, and how we're seeing those fair and and where we are historically. Yeah, so it is, it is good. I, I, I like to remind folks that uh, uh, we are putting a lot of meat out there. If you just look for a second across the beef, pork, and chicken spectrum, uh, number one, the, the very latest data that we have shows chicken production for the week is the second highest that we've ever seen uh, since January of 2007. So we've, we've been pushing a lot of chicken uh, meat out on markets. Even pork production, if you look at the latest uh, week available to us on pork production. It's the eighth highest ever uh, since January of 2007. 
Um, and, and I remind us, I know what direction we're going in terms of weekly part production between now and the end of the year. And maybe at some point we'll talk about one week of 2016 being the highest ever since January of, of uh, 2007. Now on the beef side, you know, we, we've just gotten so much negative news on the beef side. I like to remind us that, you know, yes, we're up over 4% in beef production uh, year to date. Yet, yet the latest weekly numbers that we have shows us uh, at 123rd in terms of weekly beef production. So a lot further uh, down on the list, yet, you know, we continue to talk ab about a lot of negative. And it just reminds us how short we were in terms of beef production back in 2014. Let's talk a little bit, Scott, about um, when we talk about these negative numbers or a downward move in the market, we've talked about managing risk and, and looking at uh, figuring out ways to preserve a little bit of profitability or, or to limit the losses as much as we can. What are some ways that beef producers or even uh, livestock producers in general can look at mitigating some of that downside risk and, and yeah. balancing out some of those losses? Yeah, absolutely. A very good question. I, I always go on risk management. I, I often ask producers and to, to hold up their hand if they have a risk management plan on their cattle side or on their hog side. And and very rarely do I get anybody willing to raise their hand. I think there's a lot more risk management going on out there than, than they're willing to admit. But for those that don't raise their hand, I, I remind them that, that marketing cattle or hogs the same way year after year after year is a risk management plan. It may not be a very good one. Uh, and, and so being able to, to adapt to the, to market, the current market that we have, I think, is important, especially given how much we've, we've been going down of late. Now, one of the other options that I talk about on a, a fairly regular basis related to the beef side is, you know, what do I want to do to the genetics of my herd in front? And, and is that a way to reduce risk without necessarily doing straight price risk management? And um, for, for a minute, if you just look at prime, all right, so let's decide we want to work on the genetics of our cattle herd to produce higher quality beef. Uh, I, I think there's something here in the numbers, and, and this is not just a one-year anomaly. When you look at the growth in the value of prime beef, we're up 3.4% uh, year to date in, in 2016 relative to a year ago. Uh, that, that compares to a total uh, beef value that's down about 13%. Uh, so from a demand standpoint, it's clear that uh, higher quality beef demand has stayed much stronger than we've seen in any of the other segments. Uh, choice down about 12% this year, for example, relative to that up 3.4% in prime. Now, I don't want to overstate the, the ability to use uh, that as a, a risk management strategy, but I think for some folks it works. And when you look at the technologies available to help on the genetic improvement side of, of a beef cow herd, those technologies are much better today than they were uh, several years ago. And so I think those are the kinds of things that we have to start to look at uh, as we see prices continue to move lower. There is, a, and I don't want to say it's a positive move out of these lower prices, but it does um, maybe benefit in the long run, especially if you're looking at domestic and consumer demand. Does it help there? Absolutely. I think number one, you know, so hopefully some increased consumption continues to unfold for us in this country because Lower producer prices have made lower consumer prices. Uh, I believe the Farm Bureau Federation uh, has, has turned out some recent data that would say, you know, egg prices down about 51% uh, in terms of consumer prices relative to a year ago. Chicken breast down uh, 16%, a uh, sirloin tip roast down 11%. I think all of those things are, are translating in potentially more consumption as we look ahead. And that's what we really need as we push uh, – uh, more production to the marketplace as, as all of those uh, ag prices moving lower. Now we can we can be unhappy because the percentage change or the percentage decline in consumer prices have generally been a lot less than we've seen at the farm level, especially for, for beef and pork. But I have to remind us there's a lot of other things that happen along the way once that carcass is slaughtered until ultimately that piece of beef or that piece of pork is sitting on the plate. So we shouldn't ever expect a one for one but hopefully we'll continue to see uh, an improvement in terms of lower consumer prices that ultimately keep pushing consumption uh, higher as we look ahead. And I, I talk about that because I think well, one of the other pieces of, of information that's out this week, uh, FAO often talks about a, a meat price and they're actually showing, I shouldn't say meat price, 
an overall food price index. And if you look at that food price index, it's actually moving higher, driven in large part by higher sugar prices. FAO actually drives off the very raw commodity values. And I think oftentimes that's misleading in terms of what consumers, especially in this country, uh, would see. And, and if you look at those individual consumer prices, we are down as we look through 2016. A lot of negative talk today. We've been able to find some positive news. But as we look at some of these negative movements, we talk about down prices, contraction or um, minimizing uh, return on investment uh, right now. Can from all of this negative, Scott, can we find a positive? Can it start something positive on its own? Well, I think a couple of things that, that we want to look at. N number one, we need Sometimes when we get really negative market sentiment like we seem to be having today, that that's the beginning of a bottom uh, in, in terms of where we go. I, I'm still uh, hopeful that we can talk about a rally in cattle prices as we move into the fourth quarter of, of 2016. Uh, some of the fundamentals to me suggest that, that that's an, an option that's available to us. Don't want to overstate the, the height of that rally as, as we end the year, but some possibilities for higher prices. I think when you look at the supply sides of these industries, uh, number one, we've we've really turned off much of an incentive to keep expanding. So maybe uh, at the start of 2016, we would have talked about expansion of beef cows all the way into 2018. Well, maybe we're going to shut that off a lot sooner than we otherwise would have. That might mean we can get some price recovery occurring a little more quickly than than we otherwise would have thought. Uh, so same for hogs. I think we'll have a tough uh, you know in here in 2016 and. That may keep uh, the number of sows uh, th that we have from going even higher than where we are right now and reduce sow fairings a little bit relative to the expectations we got out of the hogs and pigs report last week. So, so maybe some of those things help us uh, on, uh, get supplies in, in a little better stead as we look ahead. I, d I will remind us, though, that, you know, it wasn't that long ago when I, I would tell folks that we could have a dollar uh, a pound fed cattle, and that seemed like a good price. It's amazing how our perception or, or or what we think of a good price has changed when we got to a dollar sixty five or a dollar seventy uh, a, a couple of years ago. So we are getting back to yes, a, a, a dollar a pound in terms of fed cattle, but again, two thousand eight, two thousand and nine, we thought those were really good prices, and that's not that long ago. So we have to keep in perspective where we are, and uh, the hopefully the volatility that we've seen. Uh, isn't quite as strong as we look ahead, uh, but, but, but those are some of the things that uh, I think we can talk about maybe some pauses as we look ahead and, and getting uh, the, the markets in this very negative uh, sentiment that we've seen as we moved the last few weeks. Uh, perhaps that's the, the thing we really need to start to turn markets around at some point. Scott, anything else this week? I think we've covered the major things. You know, of course, we've got USDA is going to release uh, – the monthly WASDE report next week. I think that's going to be important in terms of uh, ultimately really from feed prices, what we do, but uh, equally what they see happening uh, in livestock markets as well. So I, I think we have that to look forward to next week. Good to see you. Have a great week and we'll talk to you next Friday. Thanks, Megan. To have our weekly livestock market update delivered to your inbox every Saturday morning, visit our website, brownfieldagnews.com and click subscribe. I'm Megan Grebner on Brownfield.